natural, synthetic, organic and inorganic. Let's do this! What's up friends, thank you for joining me in another video. Welcome to the third episode of The Paint Show. In this episode I decided to take a short break from presenting tubes and talk a bit about the different properties of pigments, mainly these uh, four ones I just mentioned, okay? So when you look at pigments, you have basically uh, two criteria. The first one is natural or synthetic, and the second one is organic and inorganic, okay? These are the two different switches that you can play with and get different combinations. So this gives us mainly four combinations and we're gonna go over them one by one and I'm gonna give some examples so you better understand them and how to know what your paint is basically made of. Okay, so let's get started. So the first combination I want to talk about is the natural inorganic. Now these are usually made out of metal or earth components, mainly minerals and this is why they're inorganic and they're natural because you just they use the the component itself as it is so you harvest the metal or the earth and you just grind the components into a uh, pigment into a powder then you mix it with a binder and all the rest of the ingredients and you get a paint now these are rarely in use today because of two main reasons. One is that they're uh, really expensive and hard to harvest. You actually need to grab, take out the minerals and then grind them and work with them directly. The second one is that the results aren't so good. Uh, the pigments are weak, they're not too strong, and so there are just a lot of downsides and these are not really that much in use today. So I've been asked about the Daniel Smith Primatech series and these in fact fall into this rare category. Now, um, a lot of brands of uh, paints like to play on the romantic idea of how they make a pigment. So for example, we, may, we take the pure rhodonite and we grind it, we mix it with gum arabic, we turn it into a pigment. Now, it's okay, it's a marketing tactic, it's perfectly fine. These are businesses, they want to sell more. And, you know, if the paints are exotic and someone is an obsessive paint collector, who am I to say no to that? But I do think it's important to know what you're getting. So, in this case, as I mentioned, the um, um, natural inorganic uh, group just their pigments aren't too strong and so what happens is that you need to mix a lot of the pigment uh, with water to get a really strong uh, paint okay so just so you know uh, the tube may not last for so long this one specifically is not a primatech just showing it as an example the tube may not last last so long because you need to use a lot of it to produce strong uh, vibrant pigment now I actually had to check this and on Daniel Smith's website there's actually a video that explains and, and this is how they say it. They say uh, the raw mineral rocks are grounded to pigments mixed with gum arabic and then turned, in, turned into paints. I'm paraphrasing but that's basically what they say and this is exactly the process for making the natural inorganic. Okay so these fall into this category for anyone who's wondering. Now they do have some cool colors and I do plan to review them in the future um, but for now I won't get too much into it just know it's this, this first category. Next up we have the synthetic inorganic uh, group. This is similar to the previous one because again it's inorganic, it's earth and metal components but this one is synthetic. So what actually happens is you take the raw minerals, you mix them with chemicals in a factory and you produce the, the pigment, the powder, that way. This actually comprises about 80% of the whole um, pigment manufacturing. I believe, I'm not sure if it's uh, for all pigments or just watercolor, but as far as I know, uh, for watercolor, at least it's like 80% of the entire industry uh, because these are really uh, reliable. It's like the previous one that's from raw minerals. The, the difference is that this one is much easier to standardize. You have the factory uh, monitoring and the, the, the organized processes, the use of chemicals, it's a bit different than actually taking a raw component, grinding it and turning it into a pigment because you don't know what's in that raw uh, component. It, it can be different combinations due to different locations and the harvest itself. So this is really common and most of the paints you have probably fall into that category. 
The third category I want to look at is the natural organic and as the name suggests this is actually uh, pigment that's extracted from uh, the pigment itself is created by the use of uh, animal or plant based substances. These are rarely used actually because of the issue with light fastness because it's organic um, it's not so stable so you actually get colors that change over time with exposure to light they lose their intensity lose they, their vibrance their pigment actually may change over time so this is what you get uh, with the um, natural organic and so it's really rarely used um, so this is for the, the third one now the fourth category is the synthetic organic again another pretty common one um, this one is just carbon based pigments uh, usually it's petroleum based or some other substances the thing with these ones is, is they mimic really well the natural organic plant or animal based uh, substances but they do have a bit more stability to them um, which allows the which eliminates the light fastness issue basically so next up I want to talk a bit about the constitution number and I have this great way to transition into it. So I've been asked a lot about quinacridone and how can it be that it's uh, present in so many different uh, paints. So you have quinacridone gold, quinacridone rose more common, uh, all of these ones. So that's the thing that quinacridone is just an organic molecule and it can be used in many different paints. Now due to, it common, to its commonality of being used in so many pigments it just took sort of the marketing name so you actually have pigments that are called quinacridone rose, quinacridone gold, quinacridone red and the thing is with them that the marketing name so if you have cyanine blue or if you have um, you know cobalt blue deep all of these ones you can't know by the marketing name okay you have to actually check the contents of the specific tube by looking at the constitution number which is the next point you have this and I showed it on the previous episodes uh, of this show you have here a uh, just let me find it here there you have it you have the constitution uh, number which is yes that's it the CL71155 hopefully you can see it sorry about my <laughs> hands moving a lot um, so this is actually the focus good so this is actually the part that interests you because this is how you know exactly what's in here you take the constitution number you google it you find exactly what it means I'll share two links uh, below one is for the Wikipedia color index the international uh, color index that actually tells you from two from number X to number Y what it means from number Y to number Z what it means um, a really good way of finding it and another website I forgot the name but I have it here artistcreation.com they also have a wonderful color index you choose the color you want to go with and it just uh, shows you exactly the components okay so this is the only way of knowing now if you buy paints from a respectable brand like Daniel Smith and Schmenke and all of those ones you know the uh, Grumbacher the um, I forgot there's tons of them um, Windsor Newton so if you buy them and you go for the basic ones say ultramarine blue, uh, quinacridone rose, all the really common ones you know you're probably getting what you should be getting okay but if you're buying from uh, cheaper brands maybe the Cotman series and the Windsor Newton maybe it's a good idea you know to make a smarter decision and actually look at the contents of the tube because sometimes to make cheaper paints they mix different cheaper mixtures your uh, paint is diluted you know all of the, uh, these things that are okay they can work I used cheap colors for a long long time uh, they can definitely work but it's always better to know what you're buying okay anyway this is it for episode 3 of the paint show I hope you enjoyed it and on the next episode I'll go back to actually looking at tubes I just thought it would be a good idea to stop for a moment uh, review that because a lot of people asked questions about it and also I want to thank you so much for the reception of the show I'm really enjoying making it and it seems like people like it too so that's a win-win um, so if you enjoyed subscribe to my channel and um, follow me on snapchat and Instagram I share tons of cool stuff there and I'll see you in another video really soon.